Good morning, and welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, I have one administrative note. I'd ask you to do what I'm about to do, which is make sure that your phones are in the mute or off position so that we don't have an interruption. Thank you. Uh, I'm David Berto. I'm a senior advisor here at CSIS, and I'm the director of our Defense Industrial Initiatives Group. Uh, and we're very pleased to be hosting what today is a, a doubly unique event. CSIS regularly sponsors visiting fellows from our sister enterprise, the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, but it's rare that such a visiting fellow has an area of study that actually overlaps with our defense industrial initiatives uh, in, uh, exercises. So we were delighted when we were offered the opportunity uh, to host and sponsor Colonel Rick Rona as our Council on Foreign Relations fellow this year. Uh, Colonel Rona comes to us from AFRICOM, and his area of study for this fellowship is private security contractors, so there's an obvious overlap with our core efforts here at CSIS. Uh, we looked at that, and we've found, of course, gaps in policy, uh, gaps in execution, and a whole host of unanswered or underanswered questions when it comes to private security contractors. So we were really pleased to support Colonel Rona's research, and that's the first unique aspect to this event today. Uh, the second is that he will combine both his research and the event together in a way that's uh, somewhat unprecedented for CSIS. So in a way, all of you are participating today in an experiment, and I'm grateful to you for that, uh, for that purpose. So uh, we'll see at the end how we've come out here. I'll be back on the microphone when we get to the questions, uh, but with that, I would ask you to join me in uh, welcoming our CSIS uh, visiting fellow from the Council on Foreign Relations. Colonel Rick Rona. Thanks a lot, David. I appreciate it. And thanks everyone here, uh, both present and on the webcast, for participating. Uh, we very much appreciate your participation and your interest in the topic. Uh, the debate today is between two of the foremost experts uh, when looking at strategic studies and particularly the issues of private security contractors and private security firms. First of all, Mr. Doug Brooks, immediately to my left, is the president and founder of the International Stability Operations Association a non-governmental, non-profit, non-partisan association of service companies dedicated to providing ethical services to international peacekeeping, peace enforcement, humanitarian rescue, stabilization efforts, and disaster relief. And that is directly from uh, Doug's own characterization. Other people have characterized it as the trade association for the private security companies. Um, so he brings a wealth of knowledge not only in that position and not only as a founder of the association, but as one who has looked from a policy perspective and an academic perspective at private security companies for over a decade. Uh, and to his left is Dr. T.X. Hammes, who is a retired Marine colonel uh, and presently a senior research fellow at the National Defense University, specifically the Institute for National Strategic Studies. He's also the author of uh, The Sling and the Stone on Warfare in the 21st Century. Um, what I'd like to talk about before turning it over to the two participants is a little bit about the format of the debate itself. Um, first of all, concerning the question, what we're looking at is the costs versus benefits detriments of armed contractors in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I use some of that language deliberately. Um, first of all, costs versus detriments. Uh, rather than simply cost benefits. Uh, what I hope that the debaters will bring out today is not simply the financial costs and benefits, but also looking at some of the uh, value and policy implications of our reliance, and it has become a reliance, on armed contractors and the significant conflict zones uh, for the United States. Um, the other area uh, of language that I think is important is the uh, term armed contractors. And by armed contractors, at least what I mean in putting together the debate, are those who are armed for purposes other than immediate self-defense in the execution of their duties. Uh, and the reason I bring that up is because this language for people looking at this topic, and especially who those who only look at it tangentially, has become very loaded. Uh, you have people who are not familiar with the industry who automatically default to the term mercenaries. Um, you have private security companies, which is used by the association and by the industry itself in their international code of conduct, which was signed by a number of the companies in November. Uh, in academia, you have private military, military slash security companies. So there are a whole lot of terms out there. Uh, I've used armed contractors to try and distill it to what we're trying to look at, those who are armed for reasons other than immediate self-defense. 
Um, the format that we're looking at using today is called Lincoln-Douglas debate format. Uh, and although it's named after what are probably some of the most prominent debates in uh, American political history, it doesn't follow exactly what Abraham Lincoln and Stephen Douglas did uh, in the 1840s. Uh, basically, we're following a format that many people who have done high school debate are very familiar with. Uh, it allows direct interaction slash confrontation between our two participants because they will be allowed to immediately cross-examine or question each other after each has made their arguments. You'll also notice that Doug, taking the affirmative on the question, uh, is given the opportunity to begin the debate and end the debate. So even though their speaking time will be equal or they'll have the opportunity for equal speaking time, Doug starts and ends uh, uh, the debate itself. Um, you'll also see that we have no AV format um, or aids that they'll be able to use. So Doug and TX will be relying on their logic, their persuasion, and their winning personalities um, throughout the debate. Uh, some of the ground rules, David already talked about cell phones. Please remember, if you haven't done it already, to turn off your cell phones and your electrical devices. Uh, the debate is on the record. Obviously, this is open forum and we are webcasting. Uh, I would ask you to keep in mind that th I've asked them here because of their personal expertise, not necessarily as rep representatives of their individual organizations. Uh, so when you are looking at citing them, please cite them individually unless you have their explicit permission after the debate to cite them as their re representatives of their organizations. Uh, and then after the debate, we'll have an audience uh, Q&A format or question and answer time uh, that David will leave us, uh, lead us through. Finally, before we begin the, begin the debate, uh, on each of your chairs, you'll find two ballots. Uh, what I'd like you to do is take a look at those two ballots. One of them says pre-debate and post-debate. Uh, they have the question of the debate, and then they ask uh, whether you agree, disagree, or are undecided concerning whether the, the benefits of armed contractors in Iraq and Afghanistan truly outweigh the costs and detriments at this present time. Um, so what I'd ask you to do is take the pre debate ballot uh, right now and fill that out. Uh, and then some of our research associates, some of my colleagues from the Defense Industrial Initiatives Group will go through quickly and collect those. And then after the debate, I'm going to ask you to fill out the post debate ballot uh, and we'll do a little bit of a comparison to see if anyone's minds or positions have been swayed uh, by the rhetoric of either of our two speakers. Okay, uh, final bit of housekeeping is for the two participants, Ryan uh, up front will be providing time cards for you. Uh, once we reach stop, you get about a 15 to 20 minute grace time and then we'll have to cut you off. Um, 15 so to 20 minutes? 15 to 20 second. Yeah, you wish, 15 to 20 minute. <laughs> um, 15 to 20 second grace time uh, and then, then I'll have to cut you off. All right, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Doug. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here, and uh, and thank you for putting this together. And I've never actually formally debated anyone before. So, uh, and and let me just say that Colonel Hamas is brilliant. He's spoken at our events previously, and I actually use many of his comments and thoughts in in uh, my own work. So I think this will be less of a debate, more of a prickly agreement on many issues. Contractors are not new, even armed contractors. And anybody who studied American history is aware of the privateers that we had back in the beginning of the Republic. Um, we've always had contractors, they've always supported the military. The numbers go up and down depending on the demand and, and that's, uh, that's normal. The security companies, the PSCs, are about 15% of contractors and the U.S., the Americans, are about 10% of that number. So there's a very small number of Americans doing the armed security, but that's really what, what you see focused on in the press. Security contractors are not hunting down insurgents, invading countries. They're not there as a replacement for armies. They're guarding nouns. They're guarding people, place, and things. They, they, while the military has rules of engagement, which are secret, which allow them to use lethal force to achieve a mission, con security contractors have rules for use of force, RUF, which allows them to defend themselves, self-protection. It allows them to protect whatever that noun is in that they've been contracted to hire. And it allows them to protect um, uh, lo civilians under mortal threat. If you can use local police and military in places like in Iraq and Afghanistan, fantastic. If they're available, but there aren't that many, they're trained up, there's huge attrition rates, there's lots of problems with them. All for it, all for training them, contractors do that as well. Uh, but we have a long way to go before they're going to be a replacement. Uh, contractors are mostly locals, and uh, this includes security contractors. There's a large number of locals, so it's, it, they're hiring people, they're giving them good jobs, they're training them up, they're giving them capacity, uh, and essentially it's relatively good jobs in a recovering economy. Taxpayers don't like it when we contract to idiots, so quality matters when you're contracting. 
there's a big issue in our industry about best value versus lowest price. And a lot of, there's a lot of pressure to go cheaper, cheaper, cheaper on the contracts. But we really need to be thinking about this when we're contracting contractors, especially security contractors. You want some quality. We need to improve the procurement system. When it works, it works great. But a lot of times, it's not working right. Accountability matters. When you have armed contractors abroad, it doesn't matter if they're local nationals or they're foreign nationals or third country nationals. Um, you have to have some way of holding them accountable legally. We have different laws that we use, the Military Extraterritorial Jurisdiction Act, the UCMJ, the Uniform Code of Military Justice. All these things can be used and have been used uh, to hold contractors accountable legally. Uh, uh, Rick mentioned the Montreux document and its follow-on, the International Code of Conduct for Private Security uh, Providers. Uh, that was a Swiss initiative. We very much supported that as an industry association. It's also supported by the U.S. and U.K. governments, and that's also going to be a game changer in terms of improving quality. Contracts work. Many of the contractor issues have just been a result of bad contracts or bad contract enforcement. That needs to change as well. What taxpayers get from security contractors is a real bargain. A high-end U.S. private security individual doing protection for, say, an ambassador, still about half the cost of what it, what it costs for a soldier to be in, in uh, Afghanistan right now, which is, according to Time magazine, is about a million dollars a year. Third country nationals, if you're not using Americans, they're even cheaper. And then if you're using the local nationals, if you're hiring an Afghan to do security work, uh, they're about $500 a month, or 166 times cheaper than using a soldier or a Marine. We're projecting U.S. influence around the world, and that costs money. And whether we're overthrowing dictators uh, or whether we have these sort of bold policies for enlightening the world or providing security, um, you need to have a contractor contingent supporting that if you're going to be cost effective, if you're going to support a rational in international policy. <clears throat> Finally, part of the question is, what do we want the U.S. military to actually do? Well, we've an all-volunteer military that's more professional probably than, and more capable than it's ever been in its history. Uh, we give our military the life, the power of life and death over our enemies, but they're not cheap. As I said, a million dollars a year in, uh, per Marine or soldier in Afghanistan. We don't want our soldiers and Marines cleaning toilets or flipping eggs. We use contractors for that as well. Do we want them protecting power plants in Kabul? Well, maybe there's a strategic role. Maybe that power plant is so essential to the mission, you really do want to have these really expensive people doing that kind of security. But what about protecting a privately owned extractive company, say BP, an oil well somewhere? Uh, what about, uh, or Exxon, or, or what about Save the Children, protecting an NGO? Do you want Marines and soldiers doing that? Does Save the Children want Marines and soldiers doing that kind of work? Uh, do we want them guarding new sewage plants, which is a big part of the reconstruction in these sorts of things? And I just kind of envision this, this letter to some mother in, in the United States, Mrs. Smith, we regret to inform you that your, your son or daughter died from defending a cesspool from looters, uh, but it was in our national interest. That's crazy. Do we want our Marines and soldiers guarding the forward operating bases where they're, where they're based? It's not an offensive operation to guard a forwarding operating, operating base. If you're hiring locals to do the security, well, you know what? They speak the language. They understand the culture. You're going to have far fewer misunderstandings. And yeah, there's 166 times cheaper than having the soldier guard it. Oh, and one other issue. When you put a soldier, an American soldier, in front of an American base, you have a target guarding a target. What's the point of that? We all want our volunteer professional military focused on the key national policies. We want them chasing after our enemies. We want them focused on the strategic mission. We want to use our U.S. military resources to change the world for the better. We all know that there are problems with contractors and PSCs, but they're not insurmountable. And both my, my uh, colleague and I have, have addressed these problems in various ways. Um, ISOA has a lot of programs in terms of improving contracting, improving the use of security contractors. Um, but clearly, they have a role, and we're not going to get rid of them. The international community has picked up this issue, as I mentioned. So that's also working to improve this. Contractors support the U.S. military. They support U.S. policies. Uh, and this includes the security contractors. They're enormously beneficial to reconstruction operations, and they're enormously cost effective. It's crazy to sort of say we can't do without these or we shouldn't do without these. Thank you. Um, I address, I actually will address most of these points in my presentation. So you want to go with questions first? And have me yeah, let's go ahead and go with uh, questions first, and then you can go and uh, readdress it in your, uh, in your presentation. Okay, we'll start at the beginning. Um, contractor. We'll start at the beginning. Contractors are not new, and that's true. Um, in fact, historically, you look at uh, the Thirty Years' War is fought by contractors. Wallenstein, a contractor, essentially becomes the equivalent of a nation state, and the power of a nation state. He has the power of a prince. 
what happened to those contractors through history? Why are privateers gone? Why are uh, the contractors gone? For instance, all artillerymen used to be contractors. Why did they go away? A uh, wonderful historical question. I think uh, part of it was, uh, well, it goes back to the French and the idea of the mass army and that you can, can uh, conscript uh, uh, your citizens to actually fight for you or you can, uh, you can find ways to make them uh, fight for you. Uh, so, I mean, there's a number of different issues on that. But I also think there's, a, there's an aspect of professionalism that, was, that we have now in terms of a standing military that perhaps we didn't have in the past. Um, I would encourage anybody to read the history of this. Uh, contractors go away in 1648 with the Treaty of Westphalia. The French Revolution is 1792. I'm not sure what happened in the 150 years in between, but it certainly had nothing to do with the levee in mass. The reason they went away is because privateers became pirates. Contractors couldn't be relied upon to fight, or they could be outbid. And of course, the uh, whole problem. Uh, Sarah uh, Piercy has a wonderful book on this. She's an Oxford scholar, did a book on this. Second question, on cost, you say a real bargain. For instance, the cost of, a, of an American contractor in Afghanistan. Uh, how do you amortize that cost for the training that was provided by someone for the security for the air base, the air bridge, the structure that they operate under, whereas the cost of the U.S. soldier is amortized, all functions are amortized, the contractor tends to only amortize the actual contractor cost. How do you, how do you handle those costs? You're, you're saying in terms of the training they received as military people yeah, in the past? Uh, the support facilities is also there to support them, but they're not charged against their cost code. It, well, in terms of support facilities and so on, yes. I mean, sometimes that's part of the larger contract. Sometimes the contractors have to provide their own support facilities. It really depends on the contract, but that's something that the policymakers have to decide. In terms of the previous training, and I assume you mean a small number of contractors or security contractors or Americans who received, received training in the military, as you did, um, it's the same as airline pilots. You know, how many of them were actually in the military flying, learning to fly, and so on? That was, that's a big boost to the airlines, of course, but it also means that somebody put how many years? Five, 10, 20 years in the military before doing their service, before they go into the, the private sector, and I think that's fine. I mean, essentially, when somebody joins the military, they join up and they, they commit to a certain amount of time, and after that, they are free. I mean, they are citizens, and, and they get to make their own decisions. Um, I, I didn't really answer the question about uh, how do you amortize those costs. They're, they're cheap because I don't have to pay for them. Well, it's just like uh, the NFL gets cheap recruits because they don't run farm clubs. But the, well, colleges are, <laughs> but not, but are not paid for by the NFL. They're paid for by other sources, whereas baseball runs its own farm clubs. So okay. there's some of that. Um, we're going to switch over from question and answer to the first negative constructive, TX. Okay. Uh, we're discussing Iran and Afghanistan, but the real point about this debate should be where does the policy go in the future? Let's face it, Afghanistan and Iraq are set. We're not going to change those in any significant way. Uh, and we're discussing, uh, I will expand armed contractors one bit to say unarmed direct support of military operations in addition to, but not the humanitarian, not the reconstruction people. And we got here logically, and uh, this paper with their copies in the back, I wrote, uh, explains how we got from one, to fit, one contractor for 55 military in Vietnam to 1.43 contractors to one military in Afghanistan. Uh, I'm going to discuss the good. That's Doug's job. There are three immediate tactical disadvantages. Doug says we can develop and control quality because quality has been a regular part of the discussion. And the way we control that is to tighten up our contract rules. The problem with that is it's a contractor sitting somewhere. When I was in Iraq, the contractor was in Tennessee. So his ability to control who was hired in Iraq was pretty low. Um, the other thing is you hire somebody, but you don't have any idea of his capabilities or his skills. When the military certifies a unit to go overseas, we spend literally millions of dollars on training them up as a unit, certifying them, and they're certified by other professionals who've usually been in the conflict zone and study what they do. They're evaluated, and if they're not ready, they don't go. A contractor's evaluated by, oh, there's my, there's my quality, and you go, yep, you're on plane, get, it, get going. We even found people who showed up with no idea how to get weapons, not qualified to handle weapons. If you've been around some of these clowns, you really understand that there is no quality control at all. Absolute unawareness of muzzle, direction, or anything. Um, we can't control our operations. 
we set up big operation centers and they're supposed to report in, and I'm sure that they religiously report every time they shoot a local or run a local off the road. I can't imagine any incentive that would encourage them not to report. I mean, the absurdity of saying we can control through radio is just that absurd. Anybody who's in a tactical situation knows that if you know what's happening on a patrol, only if you've got someone on that patrol. So that kind of defeats the purpose. We have to send someone along, and in fact, state has actually decided that. They have to send a security officer along every time they go on a security uh, contract because otherwise they don't know what the hell's going on out there. So those are two bad things. We have no control over the quality of who we hire. We have no control over what they do. We are held responsible for everything they do or fail to do by the local population. And this is very important because um, Legitimacy is at the heart of counterinsurgency. If you put out illegitimate forces and you're responsible for them, but you're not punishing or controlling them, then you're held responsible for that. There's been a lot of low-level abuse. Uh, anything from I would drive around with an Iraqi and an Iraqi pickup truck because we didn't have security. We would get pushed off the road, uh, weapons aimed at us. If a, if a military unit had done that to me as a full colonel, I certainly could have stopped it. I could have complained and fixed it. When I try to complain about a contractor, what's his description? Well, it was a big guy in a T-shirt wearing sunglasses. Well, thank you very much. That narrows it down. Um, that's the problem. The locals feel there is no punishment, and while we have, in fact, passed laws, the problem is they're virtually unenforceable. If you're a prosecutor in the United States, do you really want to try to prosecute someone who did something in Iraq? You could spend your entire annual budget on a very low probability of a conviction. We have uh, repeated cases of pedophilia, uh, sex rings, uh, even slavery. And the punishment was pretty severe. They got a ticket home. We did not touch them because we couldn't. If it had been the military, there are pedophiles in the military, unfortunately. There are people who abuse sex in the military, and we can take action. They're very difficult to fire. One of the most important things when Stanley McChrystal took over, and, and General Petraeus has echoed this, the most important thing we're doing in Afghanistan is raising the police and getting them right. DynCorp has had that contract since, I think, 2003 or 2004. Every single outside report, by outside I mean anybody other than DynCorp reporting, has been how massive failure the police system. Now, that, some of this is outside nine courts control. There's no rule of law, et cetera. But the fact is, for seven years, we've had failure. McChrystal takes over, says this is the most important job. I've got to push it. We do a review. DynCorp fails. The contract comes open. DynCorp loses the bid. DynCorp goes to court, wins the appeal. Everything's back in the bidding process. So now you've got the people. The most important aspect of your counterinsurgency strategy is being run by people you have fired for incompetence. And they ran it for the eight months. I think we're into the bid now, and they finally let the new bid. They finally let the new bid. Guess who won? DynCorp. So the most important factor is now being run by a corporation who we fired once, beat us in the courts, and is back again. I'm not sure how that works. You compete with host nation governments for scarce personnel. There's an enormous number of uh, problems there, and you see this constantly out of Afghanistan. Yeah, they hire, but the people they're hiring are the people we train. We train Afghan police. As soon as they're done, they go work for the contractor. Why? Because the contractors pay more than Afghan police. We've got attrition rates on the best trained police that run as high as 75 percent a year. We've got to look for where those guys are. They're across the street with the contractor. So we're competing for a very limited number of people. Um, we pay double. It's a huge cost saving, except that we now hire contractors to do things that soldiers should be doing and we have soldiers to do. For instance, we're leaving Iraq. We're going to keep 8,000 contractors to guard the Department of State. Now, as a taxpayer, with 1.2 million people on active duty, we should be able to squeeze out 8,000 of those to do the job. But it's easier to hire contractors. It gives us a default position that gives us essentially a low quality force we can't control, or maybe high quality, but you don't know. Uh, and it's, we're paying double. We're paying for the military guy and that. So there's no real cost savings there. In fact, Moshe Schwartz is uh, from the CRSC here. I thought he was going to be here. He's probably watching on Has done a great job on cost. And essentially, the conclusion he came to was there's no way to adjudicate the cost. Because although, for instance, medical 
uh, the insurance covers the medical, but if the guy expends his insurance, where does he go? He goes to the emergency room. Who pays for that? You and I do, through local costs. We have no way to adjudicate costs of contractors over time. I think that's a pretty bogus thing. I will, uh, there's some very specific information on this strategic, and I'll address that in the second seven minute period. Because while all I talked about there was tactical, essentially tactical is transient and not particularly important. And you can overcome tactical mistakes. But in the next section, I will talk about the strategic issues that are the real damage. It's not just the cost and inefficiency. It's the damage to your strategic position that you've got to be worried about. I'll leave it there. Okay, in a world where what comes around goes around, Doug, it's your <laughs> turn to question. A lot of the comments, I think, were, were more general uh, on contractors and uh, specifically on security contractors. I, at one point, I would just question. Uh, it, my understanding is there were 80,000 contractors in Vietnam, and, and I talked to uh, PAE. They had 40,000 contractors of their own. So the ratio of 1 to 55 is probably a bit off. Uh, that would be a peak. So, um, But I, I don't know if you're aware of that. But it, they, were, they were not doing the security so much except for the ones working for the agency uh, at the time. Um, I think, um, you know, in terms of, I, I would ask, you know, you, you, you look at a certain set of contractors uh, doing security in Afghanistan or Iraq, uh, are you familiar with the uh, state contractors and the level of training and vetting that they get to do the uh, uh, WPS contract, the diplomatic security contract? Uh, that's, again, that's a very high value uh, target slash defense. And so we spend a lot of money on it. Um, and that's probably appropriate. The question is, you still have people that are covering a very specific target, very high value target. And the company knows they have to use their best people because you don't win a contract again if the ambassador gets shot on your watch. This is probably a bad thing. Conversely, you will do things to protect the ambassador that you wouldn't do if you're a U.S. cop. Even the president of the United States so, uh, Secret Service convoy has never run people off the road. I was run off the road on two occasions in Iraq by a contractor protecting a principal. And I would say, actually, that's one of your best arguments is, is the, the, the externalities of using contractors. Unfortunately, a lot of that is a policy, as you pointed out, too. Mm -hmm. You know, if state makes a policy that essentially causes harm and harms a larger issue, uh, that is problematic. But is it, I, I would get, say, okay, if we're not going to use the con security contractors, is it because of the illegitimacy issue, is it legitimate to use foreign soldiers in a reconstruction effort to, or would the locals prefer local security to, pr to provide the security? I think there's a, there's a sort of a larger issue. Yes, you're bringing in foreign soldiers to change the regime or whatever, but is it, does it make sense to have them continue on there uh, to be seen everywhere doing all the security everywhere else? I would say there's a real conceptual issue there. Absolutely, and I, I think the solution, though, is not to have contractors hire them, it's to have the government hire them. For instance, if I couldn't go work for a uh, contracting company, I'd probably stay with the government police. There is very little training for hardpoint security, almost none. The police could do that if we hadn't already contracted it out and created a perverse incentive program that sets up the police for failure. And on the incentive program and on the, the problems of the training, uh, I think there's, there's a million of those that we can go into. And as you pointed out, not all of those are, are contractor related, but are, are policy related. You also brought up, and again, you're straying a bit from the main topic, the issue of sex ring slavery. That doesn't happen in the military. Well, maybe it doesn't happen in the U.S. military. It certainly happens in militaries and all the peacekeeping operations. So if we're looking beyond Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, my own experience in Sierra Leone, where you had 17,000 U.N. troops, you had the most amazing sex trafficking ring. Uh, and sex trade going on. Also, of course, in Bosnia, where, where you mentioned there were contractors involved with it, that was a much smaller part of a much larger UN sex trafficking ring. And uh, yes, they were military. Did they go to jail? I don't know. The contractors at least got fired. Um, okay. Yes. That's going to cut off the second question and answer. So we'll start your first rebuttal. How long do I have? Four minutes. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I mean, there are absolutely strategic issues when you bring in contractors, but one of the role uh, that the contractors do that is so important is, is really draw on the local population, start providing them jobs, uh, start putting them to work. And I think uh, uh, the Colonel points out that, well, are they taking really uh, quality people away from uh, uh, the reconstruction? Well, certainly not the security guys. The security guys are essentially people that are uh, possibly former combatants that you're bringing in training up, professionalizing, and putting to a good use. 
Um, I think uh, we do see problems. Sometimes NGOs come in and they overpay their local nationals, and instead of having a you know, desk clerk who can read and write, you have a desk clerk who's a doctor because it's better, more lucrative to work as a, as a desk clerk for an NGO than it does to be a doctor in a hospital. That's an issue you have to watch out for. But with contractors, in fact, there's a ton of, of price pressure. So you're hiring people as low as you can pay them, quite frankly, but you're also trying to make sure that they op operate professionally and they don't undermine your contract by violating the rules, by violating the federal acquisition regulations and everything else that the U.S. puts on top of its contractors. Um, I think uh, these are sort of key issues. There is a reconstruction going on. The more you're working with the local population, the fewer foreign soldiers that you see around, the better it is in terms of a long-term uh, perspective. Um, I think uh, you know some of the, a lot of the issues that were brought up were in fact uh, policy issues. And yes, there are lots and lots of bad policies. Contractors aren't there to make policy. You're not hiring companies to decide what the U.S. is going to do in DR Congo or in Haiti. Uh, you're hiring them to carry out a policy that somebody makes somewhere else. And yes, there's a lot of problems with those policies, and we can get into the training issues and the problems and the, um, that, the, uh, that we've, we've created, I'd say, with, with really, really bad policies. But that's not really a contractor issue so much. The contractors are going to do the best they can. I would say one sort of really structural, conceptual problem that we have, though, is that contractors will never be critical of their clients. Uh, which would be the U.S. government. Essentially, the last thing they're going to do is turn around and say, yeah, you know what, the go U.S. government made us do this really dumb policy. Um, they can't do that because they'll, they won't get hired again. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, a blunt reality. Um, I wanted to also touch on the vetting issue and, you know, making sure you have quality people in the field. That's really tough to do in a conflict or a post-conflict environment. Um, the way DynCorp did it in, uh, in uh, Liberia when they were training up the Liberian military was pretty interesting. There were no records for 20 years. How do you make sure somebody you're bringing in is not a war criminal, is not a rapist or something? Well, here's how they did it. Um, and actually, he was done by one of, the, one of uh, TX's colleagues at National Defense University when he was working for DynCorp. They took pictures of everybody who sort of passed the initial tests. They published those pictures around Liberia and they said, is this person a war criminal? And they were actually able to screen people out. Um, it's not easy to do this. It's not perfect, and it's never going to be perfect. But you're taking risks when you operate in these sorts of things. You're trying to change the world. You're trying to change a government. You're trying to change a, a regime. And if you're going to do that, you're going to have to take some of these risks. Iraq is another wonderful example. If somebody had a really good record under Saddam, does that mean he's a good person? If he has a really bad record under Saddam Hussein, does that mean he's a good person or a bad person? It's hard to do this. And ultimately, for the better companies, you figure out how to do the vetting. You make sure that the people you have are pretty good, and then you're going to beat your competitors uh, and win these contracts. I'm going to violently agree with you. It is a policy issue, and that's the important point. The policy of using armed contractors in conflict zones is inherently bad. He's right. Uh, Doug made the point that we put them in a policy box that forces them to do things that don't make sense from a strategic point of view. I think you just argued for my side. I think you made the point precisely that the policy cannot be adjusted so armed contractors make sense. And when I asked where did the other armed contractors go, that's essentially historically the record. You try them, you find out this wasn't as good an idea as you thought, and eventually they're either put out of business or reabsorbed into the government forces. Um, the strategic issues, the very presence of armed contractors strikes at the legitimacy of the government. Legitimacy, the prime function of legitimacy in a counterinsurgency is to provide security. When you can't provide security, you can't protect the people, you're illegitimate. That's fine if you then hire locals, and you should hire locals to do it, but why don't you hire them to work for the government instead of an outside contractor? It doesn't make any sense. It reduces, another huge problem here, is it reduces the political will necessary to go to a counterinsurgency. If I know I can hire, as in Afghanistan, one and a half contractors virtually for every U.S. or ISAF troop, then I don't have as much political will. Do you think we would still be in Afghanistan if instead of 100,000 troops there, we had a quarter million troops there? We would evaluate it and say, you know, probably doesn't make sense. We have not had to have that discussion because contractors make it easier to go to war. I am pretty sure that was not the intent of the Constitution. This is from a practical point of view. Contractors can make you invisible. Absolutely right. UN troops were much worse than any of the contractors have ever been. 
but we weren't paying for them. The people there, we were paying for them, but people there did not associate them with the United States. We pay about 40 percent of those costs. But they don't associate that directly with the United States. They do if we hire them. For instance, Blackwater has signed on to do something in Somalia. Everybody's convinced America's back in Somalia. Whether we are or not is a question, but the world is convinced we are, and particularly the Somalis are convinced we are. And from a practical question, should it be easier to go to war? Because the danger is if it's easy to get in, it's very difficult to get out. We spent over a trillion dollars in Iraq. We're well on our way to a trillion dollars in Afghanistan. From a strategic point of view, was that a good idea? Would there have been more debate if we'd had to raise the force levels and actually engage the American population? It's a good way to avoid the will of the American people. You just ignore that whole voter thing. It's so much easier. Um, there's a moral question, too. Should we hire people we don't know, we don't train, and give them authority to kill people in the name of the United States? While people will sometimes make fun of the moral position of the United States, it has a tremendously powerful value in the world when we are a force for good. When we wander off and torture people, it really causes problems for us. And it continues to cause problems for us. Contracting is another way we're causing problems. We're hiring unqualified people. We're letting them kill people in our name. Another question, should we hire poor third world nationals to absorb casualties for us? You made the, the point in your first session about, you know, do you call the mom and say your son died for a sewer plant? Well, it's okay apparently if it's just a contractor. They're not like real people or anything. But the fact is, as morally reprehensible as that is, if you sign on as a contractor, you're suddenly not an American citizen, nor are you treated as one. We should make a point that those casualties be included in our casualty totals. Those are Americans dying out there. We should include third world casualties too, and third world wounded. What's the moral position of wounding a guy badly and shipping him back to the Philippines or Peru with no support? Again, it strikes to what we see ourselves as a country. If we see ourselves as an empire, and these are just auxiliaries to be used as the Romans used auxiliaries, then it's okay. But I don't think that's okay for the United States. Um, so I'm going to end with recommendations. Oh, this is just a debate. I would say there are things contractors use, do extremely well and use them extensively in non-conflict zones based on a genuine analysis. The, the guys doing the repair work in Kuwait do superb work. They do it cheaper. They do it better. Things that are repetitive functions that can be evaluated and uh, kept track of are good things. There are places where you're going to send them where some jobs can only be done by contractors. The United States is not sending people to Africa. Just we're not going to do it. Uh, do you then send a Blackwater to stop uh, a massacre in Sudan? It's a possibility. That's a legitimate area for debate. I'm not sure where I come down on that, but it's certainly an area we need to debate. Um, the default position I would have is ban them in conflict zones. If they're in a conflict zone with U.S. troops, it mixes things up too much. You get a confusion as to what U.S. is doing and what we're held responsible for, because we are responsible for what they do. We don't go outside the wire. Uh, if it's inside the wire, I would prefer minimum contact with the local po population, but would much prefer you hire locals. There's a good point here. But you hire locals through their government. It makes no sense to me to hire a bunch of companies to pay them a premium to compete with their own government in a period the government's under stress. We also can look, um, if you have to go outside, hire local government security forces. Local military forces, U.S. contractors would be second choice and third country nationals would be an absolute last choice. U.S. Uh, local military forces, you do it by assigning uh, military forces to them, like the gendarmerie in Haiti and uh, Nicaragua. The Marines have long experience with this. We're starting to do it in Afghanistan. We've avoided that because we could hire contractors to do the job, and we've gone off on a bad path there. The failure to establish a policy on the use of contractors for the future is very dangerous. It'll leave us unbalanced because the natural tendency is to say, we'll let contractors do that so we won't provide forces for that. We'll let contractors do that. We're going to find ourselves in a position where we have to use contractors even if it doesn't make sense. And finally, we need to push hard for international laws, not an international code, but an international law with teeth and standards and processes for contractors who are going to operate in areas that governments aren't, because the fact of the matter is there's large parts of the world governments aren't going, and contractors will be the only alternative. But they then become an extra force, 
an extra governmental force. The last time we introduced that force into the world, we got the Thirty Years' War. Didn't turn out all that well for Europe, uh, unless you think wiping out 40 percent of the German population was a good idea. Okay, thanks, Doug. You get the last words. Um, I wasn't alive during the Thirty Years' War. I'm a lot younger than the Colonel, but um, <laughs> I would. Uh, one point thing I would point out, just historically, of course, was uh, in the Marine Hymn. Of course, Tripoli's in there somewhere, and uh, if you'll recall, there are how many Marines involved in that that operation? Like six, and then hundreds of people that they'd hired to help take Tripoli. Um, armed contractors do not challenge the legitimacy of a government. They do not charge or challenge the legitimacy of force. They get their legitimacy from governments to, to carry these weapons. Um, I think, uh, you know, if you say, okay, well, if, if you want illegitimacy, we have tens of thousands of armed contractors working for the U.S. government right now in the United States. It's normal. Uh, to say we can't use them in places where it may be dangerous, that's a little bit crazy. Um, if we say we can't use armed contractors in an area of conflict, does that include Mexico? Does that include Colombia? Does that include Haiti? Um, I don't know. I mean, what's the definition of, a, of an area of conflict? Does it include Louisiana? I mean, uh, we really, it, it, it's, it's strange. Uh, there has to be rules and guidelines. They have to be clear, and then, then I don't think it's a, it's a big problem. Yes, the policy structure can be adjusted to make contractors better. Uh, I would say they're doing a fine job overall. Yes, there's issues, there's lots of problems. We've highlighted those, he's highlighted those. Um, that can be addressed, I don't think that's a big deal. Is it easier to go to war with contractors? Well, I don't know, we got into Vietnam where we were using a, a conscripted military. We got into Afghanistan, I don't think anybody would debate that, you know, if, uh, if we had a conscripted military, we wouldn't have gone into Afghanistan. Uh, what about the Spanish-American War? We've made lots of bad choices in the past when, we, when contractors were not such an issue. Um, the issue of torture, that's a great one. Uh, no one should be doing torture, much less contractors. If you're going to have somebody do the torture, then, then you better damn well have, have uh, some legitimacy behind it. I don't see it. But it certainly shouldn't be a contractor issue. The issue of third country nationals or local nationals being wounded or killed. Well, if they're under U.S. government contracts, they're under the Defense Base Act insurance program. It's not a great insurance program, but they are covered. Uh, and in fact, there was a number of journalists who went down to Latin America, where some of the security contractors had come from, uh, and interviewed some of these people who had been wounded. And almost to a man, they said, yeah, as soon as I'm better, I'm going back to work in Iraq again, because it was a pretty good job, and they did take care of me. Um, there are death benefits and other things. I would argue you could actually improve the Defense Base Act, DBA uh, program, and uh, I think a lot of companies have some ideas on that. It's a clunky government-run program could probably be outsourced and improved. Um, <laughs> some recommendations in terms of the future. Yes, Africa, we've had security contractors there. I think humanitarian, I agree with my colleague, humanitarian security is a big role for them. Again, on a protective level, these companies do not do offensive combat operations of the security companies we're talking about, but they can protect people. I think it's always been kind of a, a lark that it's perfectly legitimate to go and protect an oil well in, in Angola, but God help you if you try and protect a village that's under threat. Um, I think there's a big role for that. I think the UN has already started using security contractors for, the, for some of the uh, refugee camps and so on. This is normal. I don't think it's a big deal. Um, yes, uh, we should be hiring locals. Can we do it through a, lo a local government? If you can, fine. Uh, I think the problem in Afghanistan and Iraq is essentially we took out the governments. That was the very first thing we do. That was the whole point of the mission. You've got to create a government. You have to create capacity. Uh, once you have, then they can create their own rules. They can create their own guidelines. Either you hire people through them or you hire companies under their laws and rules and regulations, as we do in Afghanistan, as we do in Iraq. Uh, and they'll be under local laws. And I think that makes a lot of sense from our industry perspective. I think I have hit everything I need to hit, and I still have a minute left. So. Okay, thank you both. Um, what we're going to do is David's going to uh, lead us through the Q&A, but um, before he starts doing that, you've got the post-debate ballots on your seats. So what I'd ask you to do is take a look at those and fill those out quickly, uh, and some of our staff will come around and collect those, and then we'll do a kind of before and after layout uh, after the Q&A period. What do we win? <laughs> Depends on the score. <laughs> Uh, I want to thank you both for, uh, uh, for a very um, uh, thorough uh, review and a, and a, pretty, a pretty dense, in a, in a positive way, uh, amount of information and commentary that you provided in, in this format, and I think it's very interesting. Uh, I would like to ask the first question, and then I'll throw the floor open uh, for additional questions. 
And, and my question is, is a rather complex one. Each of you touched on and cited uh, complexities of both government contracting and of government personnel practices. Um, I have a personal long experience in trying to fix these. It is largely unblemished by any dramatic success, but I, we keep at it nonetheless. Um, on the contracting side, there are clearly, and I, I was privileged to serve as a member of the Gansler Commission that looked at this very question with respect to Iraq and Afghanistan uh, back in the fall of 2007. Um, there were dramatic uh, uh, shortcomings in terms of defining requirements, of translating those requirements into scopes of work, of having any kind of performance measures built into uh, uh, the execution of the contracts, of having um, uh, contracting officer representatives for the government who signed the invoices and certified delivery uh, and they were largely didn't have the background or the experience or the training uh, for that purpose and in many cases it was a fifth extra duty as assigned. Um, uh, these are all shortcomings that are not unique to or even uh, um, dominated by uh, the type of contractors we're talking about today. They actually permeate the entire services contracting business and to some extent all of government contracting, nor are they unique to the Defense Department. In fact, uh, one of the things that you learn is uh, defense is actually a lot better at this than many other agencies are, which is a bit scary at times, but nonetheless uh, it, it is true. Um, similarly, with personnel system, and, and uh, Colonel Hammes uh, uh, commented that, uh, you know, maybe, uh, uh, in fact, the government should be hiring these people, and yet we all have experience, uh, either, either direct or indirect, with how incredibly long it takes the government to hire anybody. Uh, and only a little bit of this is dictated by the need to certify and verify requirements. Um, so my real question for you, you may or may not disagree with my premise, but my real question for you is, is the issue of private security contractors, whatever category, however category you want it, is that issue a big enough and powerful enough issue to tackle these larger questions? In other words, is this the right vehicle to go after fixing the contracting problems, fixing the personnel system problems, or the dynamics? Because both of you indicate that to a great extent, the issue of costs and benefits is driven in part by the alternatives. What are the other alternatives that we have here? And if those other alternatives through better contracting or through better personnel practices cannot be fixed with this vehicle, then that's really the question that I pose to, to each of you. Yeah, the um, lengths to hire all of these things are essentially embedded issues within the U.S. government. Uh, one of the problems is we take that embedded problem to Iraq. When I get to Iraq and I'm trying to raise people for the bases and stations, somehow the people who have been there before had set up this incredible civil service commission where we had to have seven people interview the person. None of the, those were Iraqis, and they then had to vote, and then there was a three-month process to hire this guy. So we have seven people who don't speak the language, know nothing about the country, are deciding who to hire. Well, I changed and just said, the hell with it. The Iraqis are going to have to run this. My three Iraqis are going to be aboard, and we're going to hire people. And after a huge kerfuffle and all kinds of threatening emails and yelling, they finally gave up and just let me do it my way. Um, so you don't have to go by these things. You can do things as neat. But the real problem is the problem in contracting itself. Contracting works well for linear problems, repeatable, measurable, linear problems. Unfortunately, war is by definition nonlinear. Minor changes in input have major changes in output. Experts will fundamentally disagree. So all of these things about wicked problems come into play, and trying to write a contract for a wicked problem is extraordinarily difficult. That is why lawyers make so much money in the United States. And it's fine if you can, you know, over the next few years litigate and litigate and litigate, but if you're losing the country at the time you're litigating, as we are with DynCorp and our ridiculous litigation about the police department, then I don't think you can fix it that way. You're trying to take a peacetime, uh, essentially English law problem and translate it 16 centuries back to Afghanistan and make it work under combat conditions. 
Well, TX is right. The, the legal issues are huge for our industry and, and something we, we've been dealing with uh, uh, quite a bit. But I, I would say that with the contractors, we've been doing the contracting wrong. It, it's really interesting when we had our annual summit and we had the sort of final panel. Uh, and in the panel, we had sort of the heads of, of the industry. And, and one of the questions was, uh, what's the difference between working for the government and working for a private entity or a non-governmental organization? And the difference essentially is that the government is all about process and waste, fraud, and abuse, the, when you work for another company or you work for an NGO, they have a goal. They say, this is what we want you to do. Um, and it's much, much easier. It's much cheaper. Um, I think what we see is that there's a focus on, on this waste, fraud, and abuse and not the mission. The government needs to give a contractor a mission, protect this or build this or whatever. Um, the scopes of work are there. The Federal Acquisition Regulations, or DFAR, the Defense Federal Acquisition Regulations, there's thousands of those, and they tell you how you do it, and they tell you sort of the guidelines of how you're supposed to do that sort of thing. But as any contractor will tell you, they're doing one um, uh, audit after another. There's an there's a Inspector General, there's the uh, Commissioner of Wartime Contracting is doing uh, audits. Uh, you have the Special Investigative General for Afghanistan Reconstruction or Special Investigative General for Iraq Reconstruction constantly being audited and so on. And there's a cost to that, and that cost, of course, gets passed on to the contract. Uh, Stuart Bowen and Ginger Cruz of the uh, uh, CIGAR, the, the Special Investigative uh, General for Iraq Reconstruction, uh, have proposed a, a separate agency in the government just to do contingency contracting because it is not linear. Essentially, you need to change these contracts. You need to have uh, run these contracts a different way, a smarter way. Uh, and the government has that capability, but they're, they're hamstrung because we essentially use peacetime contracting guidelines uh, to run these contracts and contingency operations where things are changing really fast. Um, is it worth using government personnel? Uh, I mean, we've rarely touched on the issue. Hiring government personnel takes a long time. There's all sorts of rules, regulations on that. And then when you're done with them, how do you get rid of them? Uh, they're with you forever, essentially. It's almost impossible to get rid of them. It's just a really, really clunky system. And it's kind of designed to be that way. You, you don't want civil servants doing this thing. Our whole industry is built on growth and shrinking. And, you, you know, people say there's this huge growth in our industry. Well, not exactly. It's like this, you know. Every time you have a conflict, every time you have a contingency operation, whether it's Haiti or or the Korean War, or whatever, the number of contractors goes up, and then it goes down again. Uh, it's a wonderful resource for the military, they can, or the U.S. government. They can just tap into this expertise, bring it in for a short time, and then let it go, and stop paying for it. Uh, it's, it's just a huge value. Um, yeah, I would say war is not linear, and, and this is a, a fundamental reason why we use contractors. And every contractor has changed contracts. Every uh, if there's a problem, you get rid of one contractor. If you need a different kind of contractor, you can go and get them. And they're able to tap into international resources. If we allow them to, they can go to China to get resources. They can go to, uh, they can go to the Philippines to get uh, talent or expertise. You know, does an does a engineer have to be uh, an American to do engineering? Or can an engineer be a Filipino or an Indian? It's, it's, it doesn't, it's a lot cheaper to the U.S. government, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a, an American to do that kind of work. And it saves the government money. What's important? You know, is, is, is the fact that we're hiring Americans, is it a jobs program for yeah, Americans? You're wandering off into unarmed contractors. Well, you were too. <laughs> but the well, point is, these resources are, very, are available. The contracting community provides them on a short-term basis, and it's an enormous amount of capability that, that we don't want to ignore. And yes, for security contractors, there's a role for that as well. All right, here's the way we uh, do our questions. Uh, you would indicate to me that you want to ask a question. The easiest way for you to do that is to raise your hand, uh, and I'll make eye contact with you so you know you're on my list. Uh, you'll wait for the microphone. Uh, we do have microphones that will come to you. That's so our web audience will be able to hear you. People in this room obviously will, but we'd like that to reach out as well. Uh, and then using the microphone, you identify who you are and your affiliation, and then ask your question. You can direct your question to either or both of our uh, debaters here this morning. Uh, do I have anyone who wants to uh, raise the first question? All right. Let's start out right over here, if you would, uh, Nick. Hi, uh, Richard Lardner from the Associated Press. Um, you talked a little bit um, about accountability, um, and I wonder if you could get into that a little bit more. Um, Doug, you mentioned the audits that are done, um, IG reports, the Commission on Wartime Contracting. Um, what I have found, because this is an industry I, I cover a little bit, is the number of audits, the number of port, reports pales in comparison to the amount of money and the amount of people involved. Um, so just a couple specific things. Um, 
should companies be required, whether they're public or private, to report how many employees um, have been fired or disciplined while under contract? And the second part of that is, um, does anybody know how many contractors have been prosecuted under UCMJ or any other statute um, since, pick a number, since 2001? I'm actually Doug. <laughs> uh, the number of audits and reports, I mean, you can ask for all the audits and reports you want. I mean, it just gets added to the cost of the contract. I, I think when you talk to these companies, they're, they're constantly being audited, and, and so be it. You know, that's the price of working for the U.S. government. As long as everybody's audited the same way, then it's a, it's a level playing field for the competition. They'll do that. It's not that big a deal. Uh, I think it gets ridiculous because essentially the government's spending a lot of money, a lot of taxpayer money, to do the same thing again and again and again. I think that can be, probably be uh, rationalized. I, I think you'd probably agree on that. Um, public, private contractors reporting the number of contractors, uh, or, or private contractors reporting the numbers of contractors that they actually have. I was like, kind of thought that was a bad idea in the early days. Uh, the numbers, people were claiming the numbers of security contractors were, you know, 30,000, 50,000. Uh, one famous report, I think it was AP, said there was 300 armed contractors and implied they were all Americans working in Iraq at one point. It was crazy. Uh, and these numbers were just going through the roof. Somebody, somebody, yeah, well, there was one AP report. It said 300,000 armed contractors in Iraq. Yeah, 300,000. Zero aren't that important when you're a contractor. Yeah. about the end of the contract. Anyway, so there was this, uh, uh, so these reports were just going through the roof, and finally the U.S. government went to the Department of Defense and said, we need to know how many contractors there are, and they started coming out with these quarterly reports. So we know exactly how many contractors there are, but it's kind of a snapshot in time because contractors are hired, they're fired, uh, the contracts change, and, uh, and so it, it's somewhat useful, but then we find out that we actually have, um, what, in Iraq, 11,628 contractors doing security, of which... Uh, no, this actually includes a lot of state as well. Uh, and they've been charged with actually covering all the state uh, contractors uh, as well. So, I mean, the numbers are coming out, and the state contractors are much fewer. Um, so uh, this is a predominant one, and, and these numbers have been challenged. But it, it, what it did show was that the actual numbers of contractors were well below what were being reported. So it has actually been quite beneficial. But again, I would just say, even something that is this detailed, you got to be careful because contracts are being started every month, they're being, being closed every month, and so on. In terms of the numbers fired, prosecuted, uh, whatever, um, I think, you know, should a company report that? That's fine. Uh, I think uh, if that's part of the contract, then they're happy to do that sort of thing. Uh, the Department of Justice, unfortunately, handles the, uh, the MEJA, um, Military Extraterritorial Jurisdiction Act, which was a sort of the primary um, uh, law for, for holding contractors uh, legally accountable. Um, and the actual numbers, well, as of two years ago, what we had heard, and this is unfortunately very informal, was over 65 contractors had been, were, were in the process at some stage, either had been charged, had been convicted, or uh, they were looking into the case. Now, that was like two, three years ago. That's old information. And I would agree with you that this should probably be public. Um, we would appreciate it, certainly as an association, if they actually had a website or if they had some single office that handled all this. I think that kind of, that kind of transparency just makes sense. Uh, UCMJ, um, I, I know less about it, and I think constitutionally that's probably a tougher sell in terms of trying civilians. It's been thrown out a couple of times in the past, um, and I think most uh, DOD lawyers that I've talked to say uh, UCMJ is a bad idea for contractors because it's really more of a code than it is a, a law, uh, and it sort of applies less to civilians. And as I said, the Supreme Court has thrown it out in capital cases in the past, but I know there's been at least one or two uh, UCMJ cases against contractors that have, that have gone through. Uh, it's uh, the DOD um, guidelines are essentially say use UCMJ as a last resort. And the one particular case I'm quite, uh, that was quite well uh, covered was a, um, a Canadian, um, Canadian Iraqi translator working in Iraq. And he, was, uh, he had been in a knife fight with another translator. So they confined him to quarters, but he escaped. They had to retrieve him from a nearby town. And then they're like, okay, well, we have to, if we're going to incarcerate him, we have to, to charge him. And uh, the question is, which law do we charge them under? So they figured, okay, um, let's go to uh, the local government because he's half Iraqi. Uh, and the local government said, we don't want to touch this guy. He's your contractor, so you deal with it. So the military then went to the uh, Department of Justice and said, we want to try him under uh, MEJA. And the Department of Justice says, well, MEJA doesn't apply because he's an Iraqi. Well, at least half of it. And that was enough for them to sort of back out of it. So the military ended up trying him, and they gave him several months in prison. And uh, I don't... 
I don't know if it was challenged or not. I'd be interested if, if somebody here knows it, but it did work. Um, I don't think it's ideal. I don't think you're going to be able to have perfect accountability in any of these places. And when I started uh, working with this association, one place we were looking was Eastern Congo. We have contractors operating in Eastern Congo. There is no legal system there, not even for the locals. And uh, one idea we came up with is why not use, uh, say, Tanzanian courts, uh, which everybody recognizes as legitimate, or South African or Belgian courts. I mean, it could be anything. But as long as the contractors know they're going to have a fair shake, I think it, it'll, it can work. Um, most of those convictions, as I understand it, are for fraud. Much easier to convict, much easier to set. I don't know of any conviction other than the one where he knifed another translator who was also working for the U.S. government that there's been a conviction for violence. There have been no convictions for violence on locals that I know of. And uh, Moshe and I were looking about this six months ago and we couldn't find any record of it. You can Google it, you can't find it. I would think the press would probably have covered that if they had something like that. Um, that's interesting. Hundreds of thousands of people rotating through, nobody's ever done anything bad. This is really a remarkable group of people. Or there's no accountability. I suspect it's the latter. Now, we argue about that. We also argue about the number of contractors. And we say we've got accurate numbers. We don't. One of the reasons the Constitution enshrines the press as a protected entity is the founding fathers didn't trust government. This may surprise you, but from time to time, the government gets its numbers really, really wrong. And other times, they'll flat out lie to you. The safety check is the press. I don't know if you saw that whole series on the contractors running the convoys into Afghanistan. We don't know how many people they have. The media goes out and talks to locals, and there are large convoys with battalions of troops protecting them, firing weapons in all directions. We're buying them over a million dollars worth of ammunition a month. How much of that goes to the Taliban and how much gets shot at the Taliban is a question. Um, but in essence, we don't know. And the media is out there crawling over the problem and can't figure it out. We get a neat boxed report, and somebody believes it. So, but that really gets at the wrong thing. This is all looking at the aspects of can we figure out efficiency. But in wartime, efficiency is not important. Effectiveness is. And all the argument about efficiency detracts from the fact we should be looking at whether these people are effective in our strategic approach or not. And I think the more you study it, the more you come down on, again, you're back to the fundamental strategic problem in a counterinsurgency is legitimacy. Contractors are inherently illegitimate. A foreign contractor who is not subject to any form of punishment is illegitimate, is illegitimate in the eyes of the population. And therefore, you make the government illegitimate. If you're in a competition for legitimacy, put yourself in the position of the Taliban propagandist. You couldn't make this stuff up. It's just too good. And so you can say, look, they brought in contractors. We're here risking our lives for no money to drive out the foreign invaders. They have brought in contractors. They won't even spill their own blood. They're trying to enforce a Northern Alliance government on you, which doesn't care enough to send its own people, but has to hire contractors. That's a huge win in a legitimacy argument in counterinsurgency. And so from a strategic level, we're striking directly at legitimacy in conflict. And you're right, conflict in various places. I think if the U.S. government is involved with U.S. forces, then we don't want armed contractors there. If they're not, there are big void areas where we're not getting involved and other nations want to hire contractors or certainly extraction companies have to hire contractors. That's a legitimate role. But it should not be tied to the U.S. government. Just a couple of quick points if I could just follow up. On the convoys in Afghanistan, it's, it's an interesting point, and, and there's a quality aspect here. There's a, a program where we're supposed to hire Afghan companies to do a lot of this work, and, and that makes a certain degree of sense, but you also lose a lot of oversight, transparency, and, and quality. Uh, on the effectiveness, I would say, you know, effectiveness in, in wartime is, is absolutely central, but I don't see that it's so effective having your militaries guard the sewage plants. So, if you want an effective military, let them focus on the core mission, and these sorts of ancillary sorts of things can be done by the security contractors. But your official argument, we either use the U.S. military or we use U.S. contractors. Well, no, Why no, I, I, would, I would say use both. Contractors. Why well. can't we use the U.S. military and host nation military? For instance, in Iraq, we had the uh, Facilities Protection Service. 
which had we dedicated the effort to the FPS that we did to contractors, we could have had a legitimate government force. I had, I was responsible for all FPS for the Ministry of Defense, which frankly was only about a thousand people. But by assigning one Romanian officer and one former uh, Iraqi NCO, we got them so I could drop in at various times, the guards would be there, they would know what they were doing, they didn't have any arms or equipment because we wouldn't buy them arms what or equipment. Was this was 2004. So that program was killed as we poured money into contractors. That made no sense to me. Any other questions? Uh, Rick, would you like to wrap things up here? Yep. Oh, I'm sorry. One question here in the uh, upper left. Where's our mic? There you go. Uh, Ray Dubois, CSIS. This has been a very wide-ranging discussion, and I wonder whether I have a couple of thoughts. First of all, the issue of whether we go to war or execute regime change, uh, as you both uh, said, is a real policy issues, and we shouldn't freight those decisions on the back of, it seems to me, armed contractors or unarmed contractors. Um, to follow on David's question about an alternative or alternative path of inquiry, it seems to me that we, we run a risk if, as TX has said, perhaps we should use soldiers more often than not. I want to make a distinction between the, the nouns that Doug talked about, people, places, and things, and let's talk about the people piece of this, which I think is the most problematic and the one that's created the most uh, difficulty and challenges and uh, bad outcomes. So the PSDs, or personal security details. I'm concerned that we, if we were to train soldiers in uniform as PSDs, first of all, I don't believe there is an MOS for that in the military. Well, we do, yes, but it's, it's very carefully circumscribed, it's in CIS, it's, it's within the CID and the Army, et cetera. It's, it's a very small, well-trained, very professional operation, similar to the Di Diplomatic Security Service, I might add. And I always question why they weren't putting their best and brightest in Iraq, in Kabul, in Baghdad. But were we to expand that, which is the implication, I think, of what you were, you were going at, TX, soldiers trained as PSDs, should they be? I'm worried that it might smack of a little bit of a presidential guard kind of, of uh, outcome, a military within a military, which, which bothers me a little bit. The other issue that I wanted to raise was I was at a meeting last night with uh, Refugees International, and we had a discussion around the NGOs. And the NGOs uh, are all a little bit different in terms of to what extent they work with the military in conflict situations where security is important in order to execute a humanitarian mission or in a fragile or failing state, which is a conflict maybe small c. Uh, the, 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 the interesting discussion ensued about using, or, or the NGOs uh, did not want soldiers, whether it was US military or host country military, to provide their security because they wanted to remain their neutral, the neutrality question was very important to them. And in that regard, then you only other alternative is to have something, some organization in civilian clothes, not in uniform, uh, providing that kind of, uh, of, of need. Now, it's true, uh, some NGOs absolutely flat out won't use of any kind. Uh, but certainly, uh, that is an issue that, that it would, at least in my mind, you have to ask, well, under those circumstances, would, is, isn't an armed security contractor of benefit to execute the humanitarian mission where a U.S. soldier, a host country national soldier, is not a benefit? Um, The cost amortization issue we could get into, but I think you've got sunk costs on either side of the equation and probably not a, yeah, and it's 
it is, it's not, I don't think it's, it's, it's pertinent to some of the more, what I call, really thorny issues here. And I get to focus on the people part as opposed to the other place and thing issue. Um, I, I think you raised some great points, and I know that uh, State Department people were a bit concerned using military, DOD military, to protect them because they're supposed to be on a civilian mission, and the idea of having all these uniforms around them when they're moving around Baghdad and stuff, they found that uh, um, in conflict with their mission. So they did prefer to use uh, people in civilian uh, clothes. Um, I think. Uh, your point about NGOs is also a good one. Now, most non-governmental organizations will not use security of any kind. Uh, they try to develop these sorts of relationships where they get their security essentially from the population and more power to them. But if you have a reasonably large organization, especially in places like Haiti or something, you're going to have warehouses with food, with equipment. That has to be protected. And no, it doesn't make any sense to use military to do it. And yes, that would be probably a violation of their principles. It makes sense to use security, much lower level. Uh, much uh, um, lightly, lightly armed personnel, uh, and under strict rules, under w how they can use the force. It, it, for these sorts of things, and you see it in the field all the time, yeah, this is, uh, I think this is a great point. One thing that I do find frustrating personally is that we've had a lot of NGOs uh, weigh in on our own uh, code of conduct that we have for our association, um, and they've also been helping on the international code of conduct. But you don't often see that trickle down to the field, that those kinds of policies that they're helping to develop at the higher level doesn't seem to reach the policies in the field. And so when they hire their own security, it's often thugs are us uh, or whoever the local warlord provides. And, and I don't think that's particularly beneficial. So uh, one interesting uh, plug, there's, a, or, there's an outfit called HPN, Humanitarian Protection or Policy Network, I think. They just came out with their latest version of um, uh, sort of guidelines for operating in contingency operations. Uh, and it actually has a section there on using armed security, whether you should use armed security or not. And then a section on if you're going to hire private security, these are the things you need to pay attention to. And it's just really good common sense stuff. I mean, there are many cases when things get too dangerous and NGOs should pull out. But there are times uh, that some NGOs will find it worthwhile to hire private security and it gives you some good guidelines on how you should do it so that you don't cause problems by hiring them. So, yes. At, you asked a wide range of questions, starting with the policy decision. No, I do not think the presence of contractors had obviously no impact on going into Afghanistan. Uh, little on going into Iraq other than the failure to mobilize large numbers of logistics forces to move. Different thing than armed contractors, but also very important. Would there have been a more serious discussion if we had a large-scale mobilization? Uh, that's a little bit of a problem because we had a vision for Iraq and there's a fine line between vision and hallucination. We apparently crossed that line, and once you crossed into hallucination, there's, you know, there's no logic to the argument. So, so doesn't stop yeah. But what it does is it makes the decision to stay much easier. And so we are going to stay. I mean, from the beginning of November to today, we've gone from 2011 to 2014 in Iraq with no discussions. If there's no big deal. We're going to spend a half trillion dollars there. We're going to lose 2,000 American military, have another 10,000 to 12,000 wounded badly, and another 10,000 wounded less seriously. And God knows how many contractors, because we don't know. We absolutely do not know. So it makes it much easier to stay. That's a bad policy precedent to make it easy to stay in a war. Uh, second thing, um, the question on NGOs. NGOs have a vision of themselves as totally neutral. But in an insurgency, you are, by definition, if you're providing government services to the inside the insurgent zone, you're on the insurgent side. Because again, this is a competition for legitimacy of governance, for hope for the future. If you're providing hope for that future and you're doing it in an area the insurgent controls, you're working for the insurgent. If you do it in an area the government controls, you're working for the government. So for us to accept an NGO position that, oh no, we're neutral, is just insane. You are not neutral in an insurgency. In an area where there's not a conflict, you know, not the U.S. government involved, then they're going to hire uh, locals, and they will hire guys like the technicals in um, Somalia. And as soon as we showed up, we got those guys under control, disarmed, and put very, very strict controls on them. Why do we have strict controls on them? Because we're there in sufficient numbers. We can keep an eye on them. So I think NGOs, this is a, a whole discussion 
about NGO presence in conflict zones and whether they're neutral or not. Do you, is there a danger of creating a military within a military if you create personal security details? Yeah, but we've got that with force reconnaissance, we've got that with special forces, we've got that with SEALs, we've got that with fighter pilots. All of these are communities that have an identity and believe in themselves. We are going to have to put those people out there. Whether they are U.S. government employees or contractors is the only question. In order to make them work at state, they've, in, they've instigated a rigorous training program, a certification program, and then a state security officer travels everywhere they go. Why don't we just make them work for the government? That's a problem because it's a personnel problem within the government, as you've noticed. You've had no luck changing that. But in the past, when we've gone to war and we've actually thought it was a serious war and this was serious business, we've been willing to change that. We direct commission people to lieutenant colonel not because um, we don't think he can do the job, he's not a lieutenant colonel, but because we want to control his action, be responsible for him. Um, your point about um, we've got accountability and we've got a strict set of rules, yeah, but there's no teeth. I mean, if in all this time we haven't convicted anybody of violence on an Iraqi, Actually, I was, gonna, I was thinking about that, and there have been convictions under local law, which is uh, contractors do operate under local law in most cases. Okay, but if, as a general rule, there have been very little, and I know of none in Afghanistan, other than that goofball and went and ran his own prison for a while. But he, God knows where he came from. Uh, um, also, I, but but I, I did want to say on, the, on the uh, terms of contractors killed and injured, if they're working for the U.S. government under DBA, those numbers are actually reported to the Department of Labor. Now, I think, as you probably know, getting the numbers out of the Department of Labor ain't easy. It takes a, a crowbar and a, and a Freedom of Information Act to do it. They post uh, it online. Do they know? No. They, they post it online to. for all insurance claims. Right, right. The only way it's reported the, is the total via numbers, an insurance but they don't break claim. them down. I think that's where you have to go for the FOIA. Right. Yeah. Right. So the details are where the FOIA come in. But okay. it, yeah, in any case. Yeah. But they don't report foreign. Yeah. Like if you're a Filipino. Oh, no, the they other do. Thing, they do. They do. Yes. Oh. No, they don't. If I'm they a do. subcontractor of a subcontractor of a subcontractor. You're still under DBA, and you still it still yeah. gets reported. Trust me. Uh, the one other point I'd like to make is the whole term technical, which was used in Somalia, apparently uh, came from the line item yeah, for the UN, which support. was technical assistance, yeah, and they, they, they became known as the, uh, the Somalis thought it was pretty funny because the actual technical assistance was armed security. Um, I noticed that uh, we, we really only have time for one more question. When the uh, State Department came into the conversation, uh, Ambassador Courtney uh, uh, requested the opportunity for the final question. So uh, we'll move to him, and then we'll do our, our wrap-up. Uh. Thank you, David. Um, as you know, in, the, uh, in foreign countries, the chief of mission of the ambassador um, has unified control over U.S. government activities unless uh, a unified commander, a combatant commander, is operating in the country. So, for example, in Afghanistan and Iraq, there is not a, a unity of U.S. operations, if you will, or command and control. The combatant commander uh, controls certain things, the ambassador controls certain things. Let's take two cases, and I'd be interested in your perceptions of where the dividing line between the military and the State Department uh, should be. Uh, let's take uh, a country in South America that produces uh, a lot of drugs. So you have an ambassador and the United States government may have, through the State Department, a program to do counter drug spraying. And that might include suppression of ground fire against the spraying aircraft, for example. Uh, that's all done through the State Department under the Chief of Mission Authority. Um, suppose the situation, uh, security situation in that country deteriorates and Southcom goes in to do some operation. Under your concept, would all of the, the counter drug spraying, the personal security details for embassy people, all then suddenly become a military function? Or would the State Department continue its function and the unified commander just focus on, on its own? Let's take another example, South Sudan. It is likely that in South Sudan, the United States is going to be carrying out operations under the State Department control, under the control of the ambassador. There will be NGOs working for USAID, the State Department, perhaps others as well. A number of them are going to need protective capabilities of one sort or another, both fixed and, and mobile capabilities. Those will be under the State Department control, under the ambassador. But suppose the situation deteriorates 
and AFRICOM goes in to provide some combat role. Then do all the private security operations that were under State Department control, do they suddenly go to AFRICOM or do you, you, um, you keep them under the State Department with the division authority of the combatant commander and the ambassador having different authorities? Um, if you could limit the conflict to a single country, I'm a big proponent of the country team approach where the ambassador is in charge and the military works for him. Interesting enough, in history, when we've tried this, the ambassadors always said, no, don't want to do it. Not interested. It's not what we train to do. Even in Vietnam, when we were trying to do this, and they took Maxwell Taylor, a four-star general, and made him the ambassador specifically to do this, the culture of the State Department was strong enough, the state was never really willing to run the thing. Um, we need a unified entity. That is something we haven't worked out. We don't have a colonial office to run this uh, because we're essentially trying to run pieces of an empire without an empire structure, with a republic structure. I don't want to change the structure. I like the republic structure. I'd rather have the inefficiency overseas. The real problem becomes when you're in a place like Afghanistan and the problem spans borders. You have stovepipes in state that lead into each country, but the problem spans the border. So how do you deal with that? Well, we we. One would think the combatant command would go across those borders, but we've structured uh, the NATO command, ISAF, to only de deal inside Afghanistan. So the, the heart of the problem is on the border region, and we're dealing with as if these are two totally different entities that barely touch each other. The AFPAC experiment uh, with Ambassador Holbrick, you can't break the iron pipes back here. If we are going to continue to go out and fix the world, and we better do some serious thought about how we do that. This goes way beyond contractors and way beyond who works for who. But a coherent approach and a deep understanding of what we're trying to do. We have, we're a little bit mechanical that we'll go out and fix the world, i.e., we're going to bring Afghanistan. Uh, the cities in Afghanistan are roughly about where Europe was in the 14th century, feudal with the first emergence of cities, which creates an alternative power center to the feudal power center. So early 14th century. The countryside is really about 8th century Europe. We've designed a government that is late 19th century, and the most centralized version of that anywhere in the world outside of North Korea. What could possibly go wrong with this approach? And that's the problem, is we don't have a government that is in any way good at, at doing this overseas. And if we're going to continue to do this or try to do this, then we need to build an entity that allows these entities to come together, work together on a regional basis, rather than country by country stovepipes. That may not be possible. Um, obviously, the question wasn't really addressed at me, but it brings up the interesting point of how you do a civil military operation and who's in charge and, and how that's run. And uh, my own academic uh, background, uh, I did my master's thesis uh, looking at Vietnam and the CORDS program. Uh, and I don't think a lot of people understand the CORDS program. It was very successful. Um, uh, as was pointed out many times, uh, Saigon used to be bigger than Bangkok. Uh, it was a thriving city, and uh, until 1975, it was actually a very successful reconstruction program. But it was a joint civilian and military program, uh, initially run by a wonderful uh, Ambassador Comer, whose nickname, I'm not making this up, is, is Blowtorch. <laughs> so, but he held everybody together. It was, uh, it was interesting. Two, because of the risk that was involved. It was civilians and soldiers uh, and Marines going out in small numbers and living in the villages and in the provinces and sometimes getting killed. Uh, and that was part of it. It was, a, it was part of the U.S. policy. We're going to go, we're going to take these risks, and we're going to make this happen. And it was maybe something we need to think about today. You do have to take risks. And, and TX has made the point, and one of my favorite quotes was uh, when somebody was, when he, when he was talking about the bubble that was protecting Ambassador Bremer in, uh, uh, in Iraq and how that bubble was undermining the larger mission. You know, he said, well, maybe you don't need such a large bu bubble. And he says, you know, there's more ambassadors where Bremer came from. Um, a tough thing to say. But it's a reality that if you're going to do these missions, you can't do them perfectly safe. It is a dangerous environment, and uh, it's dangerous for the military, it's dangerous for the civilians. But you can't do this all military, you can't do it all civilian, you've got to have the mix. And how are you going to coordinate it? I hope you have better ideas <laughs> than I have. So. Well, 
With that, I would, re I would note that uh, over the course of the last hour and a half, in, in some ways, we've actually raised more questions than we've resolved. Um, when you're in a think tank, that's a very good outcome because uh, we, we like to think that we will continue to provide some opportunity to wrestle with some of these questions. Uh, uh, and so I want to thank all of you here in the room for your attendance this morning. I want to thank those of you on the web uh, for your engagement and participation with us today. Uh, we'll be back to you with subsequent events shortly. Uh, we are tackling the question of uh, how do you cost properly a government employee and how do you cost properly a contractor, not only for comparison purposes, is one more expensive than the other, but actually for knowing what the real implications of your decisions are when you make them, because there are cost implications regardless of whether it's comparative or not. Uh, we also have an event at 1 o'clock next Wednesday. Uh, it'll be on the web as well, where we look in depth at defense contracting, both for products and research and development, as well as for services, because a lot of these issues do uh, come up again with respect to how do we spend our money and what do we get for it. So I uh, look forward to engaging with you on those as well. Um, Colonel Ronan, would you like to wrap it up here? And uh, we'll be on our way. Yeah, thanks, David. Just uh, two quick things to wrap it up. First of all, I'm, I'm sure everybody waits with bated breath, breath concerning the uh, um, positions on the question. Uh, before the debate, uh, eight people agreed that the benefits of armed contractors in Iraq and Afghanistan outweighed the cost benefits. Um, six disagreed, and seven were undecided. After the rhetorical skills of our two speakers, eight people agreed, <laughs> seven people disagreed, and five people were undecided. So one person didn't vote in the post ballot. So very, very little change. Um, it, just to close up, I want to uh, reiterate and reinforce David's thanks to everybody for participating, um, especially to the CSIS staff uh, for putting together the event, especially uh, Christina Obesny in the back for uh, managing and getting everything together, and uh, particularly to our two participants for lending their expertise. If we could all give them a round of applause.